Hey folks, if the title didn't give it away, it's time for another crit hit duo dive, mostly because I'd recently received a review copy of developer Ice Citruna's Frontier Hunter Ezra's Wheel of Fortune, which basically gave me an excuse to dive into the gift copy I received of its prequel, Tower Hunter Ezra's Trial. Yeah, there's a bit of a theme going on, though less of one than you'd expect given that Tower Hunter is an action platforming roguelite, whereas Frontier Hunter takes a stab at the Metroidvania genre. It's definitely an interesting evolution genre-wise, and one that begs the question. Was Tower Hunter trialsome to play, and did Frontier Hunter manage to break new ground? I'm your host Arlian, let's find out together. And what better place to start than with our initial entry, Tower Hunter, who's whose narrative exists only in the most threadbare of ways. To wit, a massive tower has seemingly existed for as long as civilization has, a mysterious edifice that no one truly understands due to being unable to investigate its contents. Until recently, when its doors finally opened, granting access to any would-be archaeologists. Or, well, that's what you would assume would happen, but what actually happens is that the current empire throws its prospective soldiers into this weird, unknown architecture and then ranks the survivors based on how far they got. Emphasis on survivors since the only reason our protagonist Urza can survive her ordeal is because she comes with a handy dandy demon hairpin, which reverses time for her whenever she dies miserably. Sounds absolutely awful really, but the risk is worth it to her, since if she ranks high enough, she can enlist, thereby avoiding a less than desired arranged marriage. And yeah, that's the crux of the situation slash the story which is laid out in Tower Hunter's brief intro. After that, it boils down to stilted bits of dialogue at the start of each area and alongside each boss fight, a good chunk of which is weirdly perverse or a bit goofy, and also localized a bit oddly for good measure. It takes until the end of the game for something relevant to happen, which made playing the game a bit painful at times, especially since these scenes play out in the exact same way every time you start a run. There's never any deviation nor is there any option to skip them so that you can rush along to your next goal. My only solace there really was that they're pretty short, but it still made seeing the first guy's scene over and over again incredibly annoying. That said though, I think it's about time to switch gears and talk about how Urza's trial fares, insofar as an action roguelite. And well, an action platformer, and I have to say, it's not bad. Combat's fairly straightforward with Urza's basic moveset being wholly dictated by the kind of weapon she's wielding. Each one has their own distinct light and heavy attacks, combos, as well as specials, which, while not overly complex, does still offer enough variety that each type feels notably different. It's still wonky, though, that you lose the ability to check out what their inputs are after you've left the tutorial, doubly so when you consider that you don't actually gain access to all of the weapons in the tutorial, and triply when you consider there's a moveless screen already, it's just dedicated to Urza's innate spells, abilities which she can activate with command inputs as long as she has enough meter. While you only have access to a few of these initially, they're a neat addition to her tool sets given their utility. In any case, the last parts of her kit can be summed up as a dodge complete with iframes and a health potion that replenishes whenever you reach a save point. Well, okay, there's also a pair of sub-weapon slots, but I found myself neglecting the hell out of these because they really don't pull their weight all that much due to some fairly serious issues with the way that scaling is handled. The only one that I actually wound up keeping were the pair that focused on defense because they're self-sufficient. But really, this is all tied to how Tower Hunter actually tackles character building. See, beyond finding progressively better gear during your runs, there's three additional systems in place that allow you to increase your odds of clearing the tower. The first of these is the crystals that drop from enemies, which serve as the currency for Urza's skills. These can range from making weapons of a given type more effective, granting Urza more innate skills and boosting them, 
as well as certain core boosts, like more potions, super meter. They're also how you gain access to the game's movement options, and you can bet I rush the triple jump and wall cling for just how much they expedite exploration. That said, the biggest boost Urza can gain from crystals is, by far, the increases to the individual strength and overall capacity of the chip system. There are items that you can find along your run that grant passive skills to Urza when they're equipped, doing things like boosting her offensive and defensive stats as well as accruing some nifty passives. What's neat about it though is that it's a modular system. She has a limited amount of slots to play around with and quite a few chip types to fiddle with, making the act of building a better Urza sound tricky. Theoretically. It's a lot simpler than it sounds, largely because the bulk of chips you'll encounter are absolute trash. The game loves throwing minute, flat games to her health or defense, or often her offense levels, though the latter case is often going to be outright useless to you since most of those hinge on specific criteria, such as wielding a specific weapon, facing a certain enemy type, or I don't know. Being at full health, just to re-emphasize, these are all for very tiny, flat increases, and it will take a noticeable investment of crystals to increase one to a point where it will make a noticeable difference, and frequently requires a lot of RNG to even find one that is in fact relevant to what you're running. And then you get to the other chips. Things like Penetration, which just flat out ignores a chunk of enemy defense, or Crit Hit and Crit Damage, which very obviously are multiplicative, and Percentile boosts to health, or more importantly defense, which just flat out invalidates their peers at an ever-progressing rate. There's also a couple of passives that stand out, like Lifesteal, but also mainly Permanent Super Armor, because however good that might sound, it's in fact better because holy shit does this game enjoy dishing out hit stun, knockback, and interrupts. But yeah, no, um, it's this sparse handful of chips that really serve as the core of the system, and why losing half of them when I died always hurt. Well, that and because the game persistently tossed special attack boosting chips at me, and nothing else for vast stretches of time. Still, that's far more forgiving than the final form of character progression, Magic Cores. Each stage has five of them scattered about, serving as incentive to really get out there and explore, since each provides a chunk of health as well as a boost to either your damage, subweapon damage, or defense. And I'd like to point out for the offense boost, it's not contingent on anything, unlike the chips, which all have their really fiddly you need to be using this weapon or be like high health. No, no, these just give a flat boost that is contingent on nothing and outscales the boosts of the chorus by a good amount, which again feeds right into the usefulness of crit damage. Oh, and also you get to pick which one of the core types you get for the majority of them, which can help shore up weaknesses. Just if you die, you lose any you collected during that run. Though, if you clear a run, any magic core you've gained instead becomes a permanent boost, allowing you to stack Urza up to a considerable degree and push through New Game Plus on a much more comfortable level. Yeah, that, that thing about crit damage? Yeah. Um, it might have actually led to me getting through a bit too comfortably at times, because, well, as much as the multiple difficulty modes add modifiers like doubling up enemy numbers or even amplifying their defense, it's mostly just a multiplier to the strength of all enemies. The closest thing to a behavioral change you'll get is their animations coming out a touch faster, but that does very little to reduce the feeling of busy work that accompanies splattering the first few floors of each run because of how the scaling works. And, um... Frankly, having the start of Urza feel like busy work isn't really doing it any favors given it sort of fumbles the ball when it comes to being a roguelite. Like, sure, it has all these systems that feed into the idea of dying and restarting a run from the start over and over again, but, uh, you know what it doesn't have? Proper stage randomization. You are going to see these same map layouts over and over and over again 
The most random thing you'll probably encounter is the weapon and ships you'll find as drops because the stage, the fast travel checkpoints, and even the cores will be in the same place. Hell, even the enemies, you'll see just chunks of very familiar spawns. It's just weird, honestly, and it makes the act of exploring the levels just feel tedious. And also, it really helps to nail down how janky things are too, because there'll be breakable floor tiles in a couple areas leading to secrets, but they're incredibly finicky to break at times, so you'll just see a map land and be like, oh, I know I'm going to be in for like three minutes of trying to find the awful angle to go and smash down on this goddamn thing. So yeah, yeah, no, just, just dealing with several runs in a row of just that. Now, I want to be clear here. This isn't a pure indictment of the game's stage design. I think there are certainly portions of it that are passable for a little hack and slash adventure when you're going through for the first time. Emphasis on the first time. By the time you were at the fifth or seventh run. And I was. I, in fact, hit more than that because... I wanted to fight the game's secret boss, and he's only available starting with A rank and higher. So you have to loop through the game a fair number of times to reach that point. Not that it even matters, since statistically, he's so friggin' amped up, it'd likely require a good dozen more runs until I could, one, not get wiped out by him in two to three hits, and two, so I could actually do any real form of damage to him. He is in a league of his own insofar as cheap boss behavior in Tower Hunter. Not that the rest are exempt, per se, since there's things like a boss chaining in vulnerability shields, as well as rapid-fire AoE attacks that aren't telegraphed well. It's, um... Yeah, no, it is a thing, and it's a thing I'm not super fond of. And speaking of things... Let's get into Tower Hunter's visuals. First off, while I don't mind the area designs, the enemy designs are a lot less impressive given a fair number of them can be summed up as recolors. The dialogue portraits are also a bit quirky, as they possess a certain amateur roughness, which can feel especially prominent at times, and yet, to the game's credit, there is a fair degree of variety to be found among them. But yeah, that's largely what I have to say about the visuals, except for one thing. While I think the novel Lava Chase segment is sort of neat as a concept, the execution is sort of terrible due to a combination of a fixed camera angle and an invisible wall, which conspires to make the segment just out and out tedious, especially since it translates to enemies getting free hits on you when you try to hop up to a segment preemptively because you don't want to sit there clinging to a wall waiting for lava to catch up to you. Really, the only upshot to that segment is that the music's actually pretty good. Though, um, given that the OST isn't super varied, I was actually starting to get driven a bit crazy by a lot of the other tracks by the time my third playthrough rolled around. And that's really the core of things, isn't it? Despite all the time I spend this game, would I actually recommend Tower Hunter? Well, on a narrative front, there really isn't all that much to latch onto. It's a fairly shallow experience, mostly defined by the sort of pervy slapstick you'd see in countless generic animes. The most notable story-related element is the ending, which at the very least does set up a sequel, but I mean, it's mostly just a relief that it's over. Which means everything hinges on the gameplay, and... Well, the best thing I can say about it is that it's okay. There's a sort of jankiness to the entirety of the experience, but I did find myself having fun fiddling with the different weapons and learning the ins and outs of the chip system and how to build Urza. Unfortunately, that's not really enough to save it, if only because of how the game itself is built. At the very end of the day, Tower Hunter stumbles over the very fundamentals of what a roguelite should be. While it entirely expects a player to challenge its stages repeatedly, it lacks proper randomization, putting players through identical iterations whose changes are subtle at best and nonsensical at worst. And the small set pieces lodged in most of the regions do very little to detract from their overall sense of blandness. 
The most interesting elements are ultimately the enemies themselves, but again, even that rapidly begins to erode given you're essentially running through the same stages over and over again, navigating hordes of tanky mobs who love to dole out hit stun and don't actually have all that much to their repertoire. It's exhausting. To the point that me bouncing through the difficulty settings for footage of the bonus boss is basically an act of masochism. Which is to say, I went into this wanting to like Tower Hunter, but it stumbled as far as an action platformer went and fails. It fails so badly, just falls utterly flat as a roguelite. And once I got over my grinding induced Stockholm syndrome, I ultimately have to call this a fail. It is a great example, in fact, of why I will pause a few days after I've played a game and just sort of go over all of my thoughts and I'd be like, nah, you know what? This was actually really bad. I was playing it for the wrong reason. I was playing it for this video. And was I having fun? No, no. So, <laughs> yeah. Having said all that though, you might think it's weird that I then chose to continue and pick up Frontier Hunter, but it's an entirely different experience. First things first, let's set the stage. Having obtained her hunter's license in Tower Hunter, no, not a real spoiler there, it, yeah, no, she wins. Urza has since moved on to bigger and better things, namely becoming a live streamer. Yeah, I wasn't expecting it either, getting a soldier license to become a live streamer, but um, I'm sure there's a precedent for it somewhere. Though, to her credit, it's as a member of an expeditionary crew, showcasing their journey to venture past the boundaries of the currently known world. A valiant journey that falls apart in no time at all after a disastrous run-in with a storm sees the expedition's airship crash landing into a new and mysterious continent. And an exceedingly hostile one at that, given the monsters running rampant across the countryside. That said, while her journey can initially be summed up as searching around for airship repair supplies, it's not long before she begins to delve further into the secrets of her surrounding, and to the shrouded past of her demonic hairpin which seems to have ties to that brand new land. Yes, he's still a thing, and while he's still a bit of a lecher, he's actually a bit more tolerable in this entry. In part because some of his perviness has since been inherited by our new teammate, Sierra. That's right, we just cannot escape all of these anime tropes. Yeah. Still, even from the get-go, the storytelling is a large improvement over its predecessor. While the initial scenario is still fairly basic, the overall quality of the writing is better, and it just feels more fun to engage with. It helps too that while there's a lot more dialogue, a lot of it is simply the characters talking amongst themselves as you explore, so it doesn't really break you out of the action, save for the cutscene segments, which tend to be fairly spaced out. Also, as much as things start out fairly straightforward, the story does get a bit more in-depth as time goes on, providing an altogether meatier adventure to engage with, even if a few of the late-game plot points were fairly predictable for me. It's fine enough. But can I say the same about the gameplay? Well, first off, it completely eschews the roguelite elements of its predecessor, rather than the experience being defined by repeated attempts at a poorly randomized world, Frontier Hunter chooses to instead throw players into a legitimately vast and interconnected map, rife with secrets to discover, a good amount of puzzles to tinker around with surprisingly, which start out a bit easier but actually get better, and all sorts of shortcuts you can earn. Essentially, it leans hard into Metroidvania territory, including a number of core movement abilities you can earn as you progress further into the game. Which is all fine and good, but what actually got my attention was the fact that it's not only possible to sequence break segments of the game, but the game is wholly aware of it and even rewards you for it. And I mean, beyond the whole gaining objects earlier than intended. See, if you're enterprising enough to figure out how to finagle the system, like leapfrogging off an enemy's head to get into a higher ledge, you'll earn a That's Cheeky bonus, which grants a fairly substantial amount of experience, at least relevant to whatever section of the game you find it in. 
which is a nice reward in and of itself, but also makes it easier to skip segments of an area without being underleveled as you might have otherwise been when you reach the inevitable encounter with an area's boss. Relatively, because the further into the game you get, the more you can just outright bypass. To the point that I actually wound up doubling back for an exploration upgrade I'd left behind in one of the final upgrades. Mostly for the sake of completionism, really, because the game gives you some great mobility options if you know how to swing it. That said, I am aware some Metroidvanias purists might actually chafe at me classifying the game as one, if only due to the way it is crafted. See, while every individual area is fairly vast and has quite a large number of optional segments and routes to meander around, the order of regions and bosses you need to tackle are fairly linear. While there are occasional moments where you can stick your toe into an alternate route, you generally can't make much in the way of progress unless you do things in order, or really finagle the sequence breaking. Also, as far as backtracking goes, well, you're generally able to clear almost an entire region during your first pass, with your only real reason to return usually being a few self-contained rooms. I mean, there are the occasional inter-regional shortcuts you can unlock, but those don't really contribute much in the grand scheme of things save for convenience, though given the sheer size of some of the areas, they help even with the existence of a fast travel system. Here's the thing though, it legitimately took me days after I finished playing for this to dawn on me because, well, I just had so much to do, like scouring every area like a murderous repo man, kicking in walls, and finagling silly jumps to loot everything, and it wasn't even for the sake of the gear. Like, it certainly helps to get it, since you're generally able to find better gear long before you can craft it, and the stat boosters you can find are nice, since they apply to your current and future teammates, but the real incentive for me was the weapon skill books. Essentially, these are reminiscent of the hidden skills that all the weapons in Tower Hunter had, except that Frontier Hunter goes a step further, or a couple steps. See, if you're a diligent explorer, you're able to unlock five or so skills for every weapon type in the game, which takes those basic combos for all of the weapons and then thoroughly expands them into incredibly distinct combat styles. Styles which you can chain together with a surprising degree of fluidity, allowing you to tailor the playstyle of your party to your liking. Especially when you factor in the ability to wield two different weapon types as a given character, allowing a decent number of permutations. And also, you have multiple pages of potential character loadouts. You can set yourself between a crit build, a focus on like a whip and a katana. It's, it's good stuff. It's also comprehensive enough that I highly recommend getting familiar with the other characters as you get them, because not only can you swap between them with little more than a brief cooldown, well, it just helps to be ready, because if a character gets knocked out, you'll be stuck using your other party members until you reach a checkpoint. So being familiar helps. Which, yeah, incidentally, death is handled a bit differently here, because as much as Frontier Hunter makes this narrative point of mentioning that Urza can rewind time, a few times in fact, you know, the thing that served as a justification for the Tower Hunter roguelite gameplay loop, death is decidedly more final this time around. If you play too recklessly, you'll simply lose all progress since your last save. Which, uh, can suck, because I did occasionally find myself grinding due to the last import from Tower Hunter, and arguably my favorite bit of customization. That's right, we have modular character upgrades again, this time in the form of a revamped Magic Core system. Like its predecessor, Magic Cores provide stats, such as extra strength, health, resistances, or chunkier upgrades like extra crit rate and damage. That said, what makes this system interesting and gear hunting important is that every piece of equipment has a certain number of nodes available to have a core slotted in which by extension dictates how many cores you can slot in or if you can even fit in some of the bigger options. No lie there, there were more than a few times where I actually switched a character's offhand weapon just to squeeze in a few more cores, since their passive stats apply to your characters at all times. So 
Yeah, even at a glance, there's a bit of crunchiness going on, but what makes things get really funny is when you factor in the passive skills. These can range from things like damage over time effects, status resistances, flat damage resistance, percentile damage resistances, bonus damage to bosses, or funnier options like constantly losing health for a boost while also wearing a core that makes you stronger at low health. Your only limitation on this front is the fact that you can only benefit from one passive skill of the same name at a time. But even then, every single enemy in the game has a magic core they can drop, so there's a literal library of them to find and mix and match, though um, the drop rates can suck a bit beyond the fixed drop rates from the bosses, so if you are of a mind to grind, I highly suggest getting the extra drop rate core and looking into the meal crafting system. Because yes, the meal buffs are pretty short, but you can use them from any save point and beyond the massive stat boost of the later ones, one of the earliest ones you can get is, yes, better drop rates and it helps so, so, so much. Though I should note on the subject of drop rates, the game is a bit more forgiving than you'd think too. In the odd circumstances where you leave a good drop behind after say, getting knocked off a ledge, well those drops are persistent, it's super convenient. I suppose the only other thing I really have to comment on the gameplay itself is, well, the combat. And on the whole, I think Frontier Hunter is a major step up from its predecessor. Even beyond the vast improvements made to character skill sets, there's also a much broader array of enemies to face off against, a few of which serve as decent reminders to not face tank. They also serve as a decent reminder to master the limitations of the dodge early on, since while it does provide iframes, it does not go through enemies, at least until a late game improvement which can lead to some funny and or painful mistakes. Especially when it comes to the bosses. Now, I mostly say this out of fondness, but um, there's, there's a couple times in the game where you'll walk into one of them and they just feel like a, a little bit overtuned or cheap. I'm not talking about Alicia. I mean, she, she is super durable and hits like a train. No, mostly I'm thinking of the Fallen Elf because she'll just try to use a long-range grapple and auto-snag you the instant the scene before her fight ends. Like, right when the fight starts, you are probably getting grabbed and eating shit, and it shreds you. It is such an absolutely frustrating thing. Suffice to say, I'm incredibly grateful that there is generally a save point or transport point near a boss's arena, and that they're kind enough to fully heal you after a boss fight, so a random enemy doesn't just plink you into oblivion while you're leaving. Or an area obstacle. I wasn't quite sure when I was going to slip in a moment to whinge about this, but I think here's fine. I just want to say, I, I want it on the record, the fire caverns are dog shit. They, they are dog shit to navigate due to a constant rain of flaming dot inducing fireballs, including a segment which legitimately asks you to just platform up a chute as a more intense downpour of the garbage heads your way and knocks you around. You know how I cleared that part? I did it backwards. I sequence broke that segment to get to the end of it with some double jump air dash and katana aerial combo shenanigans, looking all fancy, got to the end, and bypassed all of it, doing it the proper way, because it was such a wretched time. And just me and non culpa there, I, I do not feel bad. I don't feel guilty. But yeah, you know what? That is, that is a very small grievance, so... That, that's the gameplay, so yeah, let's move on to something new, namely the visuals, and quite frankly, this is such a massive step up from its predecessor. The character models and their animations look a lot nicer this time around, as do the dialogue portraits. Also, you can play a little bit of Fashion Souls on the cosmetic side of things, since there's some alternate outfits and hairstyles, with the hairstyles even being able to be tweaked color-wise, but beyond a couple of outfits for Urza, the bulk of them are paid DLC. Or they were, but a DLC just recently dropped, uh, a free one, so you can get some bikinis for everyone once you beat the post-game thing. 
Anyways, beyond that, the only cosmetic thing you'll really notice is when you're swapping around your weapons, since they all do have different appearances when wielding, even if a bunch of them are recolors. As for the game at large, I do think on the whole that the environments look great, with a few of them really sticking out as vibrant and nice to explore. Likewise, the enemy design is largely good, with very little in the way of reused enemies, unless you count a few returning from Tower Hunter. The bosses especially stuck out to me, since they've got some fairly diverse movesets to show off. Oh, and um, this is more of a utility thing, but the map is pretty useful and it lets you plant down markers. I know it's a minor thing, but yeah, it's, it's nice. As for the audio side of things, the OST this time around is a lot more varied, so I never reached a point where any particular track galled me. In fact, a couple of regions like the underground prison and also one of the later cave segments are absolutely great. That said, I think as far as sound design goes, the part that I was looking forward to the most was the voice act in the game was boasting about. And it sounds fine, but I can't speak a lick of Japanese and there's no English options. It is subtitled all the way throughout, so, you know, it's fine, mostly. Again, there's some tiny localization quirks, but at the end of the day, when I boil things down, Frontier Hunter is a major step up when compared to Tower Hunter. For instance, while the narrative does take a bit to get going, there's a lot more substance to the overall journey, and the interaction between characters can be summed up as more than just a vehicle for some new pervy joke. They, they still crop up, but it's better now. Like, yes, it's predictable, but frankly, I did find myself occasionally curious about where the story was going. That said, and I will be entirely honest about this, what really hooked me was the gameplay. On the exploration side of things, I had a lot to work with and unearth over the course of the game, and I did appreciate the few novel changes of pace which crop up here and there. And again, I really did enjoy the fact that the game didn't just enable me to goof around in sequence break, it went out of its way to reward me for doing so. And the combat. It's hard to express just how good it felt when I first chained together a nifty little custom combo or how I continually found ways to refine the execution and tack on more steps. You get a lot of tools to run rampant with, such as figuring out that you can preload inputs during the tail end of an action to immediately chain into another one, and I just wound up using all of these tools during the course of my playthrough across all three characters. That and just hyper fixating on the customization elements. Making busted builds is delightful and putting them up against overpowered bosses in the hidden arena is a great way to test how efficient your current loadout is. On the whole, I just had a lot of fun with it, which is why I ultimately call Frontier Hunter a solid, solid hit and a great example of how a developer can learn from their earlier experiences by both building on their better ideas, but also refining the ones which weren't executed as smoothly, such as making a number of the spells useful. Except poison, it still blows. <laughs> Anyways, with the way things have come along, I won't be surprised if the third Urza game sees the introduction of an improved quest system. <clears throat> <clears throat> Anywho, thanks for tuning in. If you have something to say, leave a comment. And if you enjoy my efforts to create new indie reviews and interviews, hit subscribe and the bell. For a link to my Discord, the Crit Hit Cauldron, check the description, and check out my Patreon to see reviews early and support the channel, like Green Witch Babby and Annie Noted. Or, you know, all the people scrolling by on the screen right now. Also, I have a merch house with neat swag like Crit Hit coffee mugs and shirts, and there should be one that'll be guest starring Yzma down the line, provided more people buy shirts. I'll, I'll maybe show it off in a stream one day when I get camera. That said, I'll catch you on the next episode of Crit Hit. Take care till then, folks.